This is Michael McClevey. Does losing lead to winning? An analysis of the winning paradox in sports. This dude is NBA Vsauce, bro. This dude, this this dude is it. He got it for real. So shout out to him. Oh, everyone knows this feeling. Touchdown! Warriors down 16. Your team is down, but Boys, let's go down. there's a glimmer of hope. Curry gets free and hits. And then ignition sequence starts. Curry way down top. A comeback. Zero. Bang! And Patriots win the Super Bowl. Of course, not every comeback Cardi, is a not win, as much. Why does it always seem like Team Stage One? Is this just a feeling, a misguided judgment of sorts, or Eight to three. does this actually tend to happen? The is this the art of the comeback? When they're losing. This is a story about one of the strangest phenomena in sports and in life. It's 1996 in Salt Lake City. And the Jazz are getting absolutely embarrassed on their Chat, look at this quality, bro. The what the fuck? The team has done more than acclimate. The Nuggets are up 36 points in the first half. Damn. Smattering of booze. Damn. Yet in the second half, something odd starts to happen. Jump hook. Got it. Over the half. On a sec. Yes. 17 point lead. Alone again. 12 point game. Stockton to Anderson. The Jazz were going to win this game in this otherwise insignificant night in Utah would turn into the greatest NBA comeback ever. A record that still stands A today. A 36 point now, comeback. This game is an outlier, but Clippers at Washington is keenly aware of both was last sides year? of this experience. When you are up, there's an unnerving sensation in the pit of your stomach, an otherwise confusing discomfort in knowing that eventually the other team will stage a run, narrowing the score in nail-biting fashion. And a slice of peace was just an illusion, an eye of the storm. And when your team is Damn. down, there's oh my disgust, God. but there's this lingering flicker of hope, excitement at the first sign of anything positive. Eventually, you know that your team will come back, and you've seen this movie before. But do teams actually play better when they're down and worse when they're ahead? Turns out, they do. This is mm. just a rubber band, but it's actually much more than that. It's symbolic of game flow in seemingly every sport. In fact, it's what this effect is called. And just take Now my question is, does 2K know this? God, lame ass developers, man. I swear. <laughs> Cause I need to know this for the 2K sin, man. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at this chart by Mike Bowie from Unpredictable on the NBA. Now we've colored this to highlight the Yeah, no, I, I said I said um Jesus Christ, starter of hell. Um I mentioned him in the last video I reacted to. And the comment section was saying, yo, this isn't just a nobody. Like, bro actually played pro basketball at one point. So this guy is certified. This dude is this dude is NBA YouTube JJ Reddick. What? This is thinking basketball with handles. You know, like he, he's one of them ones for real. The effect, but it's really best if I explain it by example. Let's assume that the Boston Celtics are favored by four points at home against the Denver Nuggets. And at the end of the first quarter, the Celtics lead by 14. The point differential is 10 points higher than the spread. If there was nothing atypical or strange but about leads, one would expect the Celtics to continue adding on to this lead. They were the favorites by four points. So if there was no rubber band effect, one would expect the Celtics to add three points to their lead. Four-point favorites. There's three remaining quarters, so one would expect them to add three more points to their lead. Thus, one would project the Celtics to win by 17 points. However, and anyone that's ever done live betting may have noticed this, due to the rubber band effect, the Celtics would instead be expected to underperform that expectation by five points. So Why? they would be expected to be outscored by two points for the remainder of the game, or putting it all together, they would be projected to win the game by 12 points, not 17 points. And this isn't just my belief. This is what actually happened. 
In fact, this is what's happened in every modern NBA season. The effect is Damn. strongest <laughs> earlier in the game with larger leads. That diminishing over time, which makes sense because, well, there's just less there's time less time, to there's maybe less time. catch up. The stark contrast here is really undeniable. When teams are behind, they tend to outplay the other team, that gap narrowing over time. And vice versa, when teams are ahead, well, they tend to get outplayed, at least relative to the point spread. It's an effect that can even be experienced in video games. At least uh, I like to tell myself so I feel better. The first question that I had about this chart was, does it account for selection bias? And Mike said that it did. That's that. That, that is interesting. You know, you know what's crazy? I had this theory that, and, may, and maybe you can't actually program this rubber band effect that he's talking about in the game. But like when I used to play 2K, like, well, not when I used to, but when I play 2K, I just know a run is coming at some point from the other team. I don't give a fuck if it's a CPU. I don't I don't give a fuck if it's um if I'm playing another team. Like I don't give a fuck what my lead is after the first quarter. I just know at some point if I have a lead, a run is coming. And I don't know if that's what he is talking about, but it might be. It might be. I never trust my own leads, man. Never. And that's probably that might be why I sell so many games too. But <laughs> hey. point spread control. I realize now as I say Mike, it's, uh, it sounds like I'm talking to third person. I'm not. Uh, it's just a byproduct of having the most common name of 44 years in a very confusing childhood. Here's a simpler chart from Nathan Walker. The points per possession falling as the team gets Have a lead. Seen, I won't be this seems to happen in just yeah. about every sport, football, soccer, hockey, but why? Well, some of this can be explained strategically, and I won't try to tackle each sport here, but when teams are ahead, they maybe shift to more defensive strategies, which makes sense at times. It's a form of risk aversion. But risk aversion is different than risk neutral. As Rao and Goldman pointed out in their paper about the NBA, they noticed that when teams are ahead, they seem to try to avoid risk, taking more twos than usual. Oh my God. I know exactly what he's talking about as a Celtics fan. Bro, listen, I love Ime, but if there was one thing about how he coached the team that pissed me off, and I genuinely think this is why we lost some of those games in 2022 and why we have blown so many leads in the last couple of years. And I know he only coached one year, but regardless, regardless. We would do this thing where when we would have a lead, we wouldn't... Let's say, let's say we, we would have like a 10-point lead... Um, with six minutes left. For the rest of the game, we would not be... We would we would go into an offensive set not trying to score, not trying to make the right play. We would just hold the ball. We would just play for clock. Just because, hey, logically speaking, you have the lead. All you got to do is play defense and run the clock and we win the game. But what would happen was because the the offense would get stagnant as fuck, we wouldn't score. We would we would go down the court, zero points on our end because we're not trying on offense. The other team would score. Ten goes to eight. We do the same shit again. Eight goes down to six. We do the shit again. Oh, other uh, next possession, they hit a three. Oh shit, it's a three point game now. All of a sudden, after three goddamn possessions, because you wanted to give up with like. Four minutes left in the game. Like, that shit used to piss me off, bro. God damn. And I think a lot of coaches do that. Maybe I just don't notice because I don't I don't pay attention too much to other teams. But as a Celtics fan, I... Well, not not don't, don't pay attention too much to other teams. But I just don't pay as close attention to other teams and, and for, for things like that compared to the Celtics. But, like, yo... This is, in a world where three is quite literally 150% more than two, an inefficient approach, a sign of tightening up. And I'm not just talking purely situational here where you're up four and you maybe want to kill clock and not take an early three. This effect can be seen far earlier in the game. On the contrary, teams that are behind seem to increase their three-point shots. And efficiency seems to increase for both twos and threes, a sign of a more effective offense. In paradoxical fashion, 
teams that are ahead tend to play in a losing way. Mm. The teams that are behind play in a winning way. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I saw a lot of this. So I was an aggressive basketball player, like many aggressive basketball players, often there he to is. my own detriment. There's I the tape. I struggled to pick and choose my own moments at times. But one of the things that always confused me, and I thought at least one of my coaches misunderstood, was how to manage a lead. Uh, for example, if we had built up a few point lead in the second half and the other team started pressing us, we would institute our press break, the goal of that being singular to just break the press, not to exploit an overly aggressive defense if an opportunity presented itself, but rather to just maybe get the ball across half court. Now, clearly this is situational. You shouldn't just maybe go attack a press if you have a five point lead with a few minutes left, or there's 30 seconds left in the game and you're up by two. I'm not saying to just go blindly attack a press, but I often found our coach screaming for conservative play early in the game, maybe earlier than we should have been playing conservative when we were up by five at the beginning of the second half, sometimes even earlier than this. Well, this led to a more passive style and a team with less time to set up their mm. offense. Anyone yeah. who has ever played any sport can relate. It's because they don't get into the photo offense versus playing, playing not to, to lose. Not to lose. But this yeah. is anecdotal and difficult to measure. So, <laughs> what other reasons are out there? Just thinking. W ball knower. W ball knower. It's possible that the Celtics built this lead because of an outlier quarter. Well, that got to be the shot seventy-five percent from three in the first quarter, but. Over time, one would expect a reversion to the average, a reversion to the mean, as they take more threes. But it can't be a reversion because our chart accounts for this. Our chart is using the pregame point spread. Teams are just going beyond this point spread. There's an exaggerated effect, almost as if Lego there's group. an the Lego invisible group, force pulling these teams back together. And gravity, also. Shooting efficiency for both twos and threes increased for the team behind. To quote, the trailing team displays an overall boost in efficiency for both shot types. Now, one might confuse this increase in efficiency with a popular fallacy. Kind of looks like Jesse from Monte Breaking Bad. Carlo fallacy, or for you addicts Jesse out there, the Bad. gambler's fallacy, a belief that a certain random event is less likely or more likely to happen based on the outcome of previous events. For example, stating that a shooter is due if that... I'm not going to lie, prize, prize picks cook with that, dog. I ain't going to lie. Jesus. Like, they have, they have this thing where, like, you can check the performance of a player on a certain prop for the last uh, five games. And this is something I used to do. Ironically, back when I was winning. <laughs> um, Like, I was, okay, so this dude has hit the over four out of the last five games. He got a hit tonight. But in actuality... Um, that's a that's a logical fallacy. Um, because the way they set up the prize picks lines and all of these lines in gambling, it's at 50-50, so it's essentially a coin flip, right? It's essentially a coin flip, or as close to a coin flip as you can come to these predictions. So what that means is if you flip a coin, right? If you flip a coin five times in a row, and the first one is heads, the four uh four the four straight Coin flips is tails. Just because four of the last five flips were tails does not mean at all that the next flip is going to be tails as well. There's still a 50-50 shot that's going to be heads or tails. But what people do is, hey, it's been tails four out of five times. This one got to be five out of six. When in reality, you got to assess the other factors that go into that specific coin flip than just... Hey, four out of five times, got to do it again, you know? So, calm, calm, those, calm those statistics lesson from your boy Souls, probability, and things of that nature. Yeah. That shooter's been missing shots. In our example, one might say Denver is due to make more shots because they previously missed shots. Now, much of this has been debated. Thaylor's work on that computer science to comes yeah. to mind. It's this whole notion of momentum. Does it exist? What is it? It is a complex subject, perhaps a future video, but still, this is a potential variable here. However, all of this talk about one side of the court for this elasticity, what about the other side of the court?
I wonder how long these videos uh, take. B souls and the B stands for big math part now. Put it best when you just add big to anything you want to call it. Evaluating defenses was kind of like chasing ghosts. It's a difficult thing to do outside of maybe points per possession or effective field goal percentage of a player within a certain defender's range. It's kind of a difficult thing to gauge, but clearly there are good defenses. There are seemingly good defenders as well. But when we're measuring the rubber band effect, we can't just look at good defenses. We need to consider all defenses. Mm. And what we find is, as Nathan Walker mentioned, points per possession drops across the board as the team builds a lead. Is this just caused by better defensive effort and thus a better defense as a team buckles down on the brink of a game maybe slipping away? Or is this just worse offense? Maybe teams, as Goldman and Rao pointed out, I think it's worse shot selections as they get ahead, and well, vice versa. It doesn't it's have to be difficult black and white. to know, and I would be wary of anyone giving an absolute Unless you said something here. else. That'd be kind of crazy. But. I mean, I know I've uh, certainly experienced a psychological effect here that many players can relate to. Getting scored on. Oh, wow. Tends to <laughs> maybe motivate you. Might even oh. motivate you more when the coach proceeds to chew you out in the subsequent timeout. No, out. that's uh, crazy. Might even exert a little bit more inertia on the defensive end over the next few possessions. You might even try. Um, now, evaluating the psychological is challenging, just as evaluating the defensive side of the basketball is challenging, but that does not mean by any stretch that one should assume that this is not worth exploring. And this quickly gets into Devin Pope and Jonah Berger's work, Can Losing Lead to Winning? This study looked at over 18,000 NBA games and over 45,000 college basketball games. What do you find this year? They found that teams that were down by one ended up winning more often than teams that were up by one at half. But another possibility, at least following what? some psychological literature, suggests that's kind of crazy. The players that are slightly behind might work harder. They might try harder. Now, it should be noted that this paper has been contested, but this idea of loss aversion, it's nothing new. It's been around since 1979 when Tversky and Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for it. Prospect theory, the largely documented idea that losses in this case carry a larger emotional impact the Harden clip is funny than as gains fun. of the same magnitude. At halftime or a quarter or a timeout, Staring at the scoreboard and seeing that your team is down might serve as a salient reference point. And consequently, a player that receives this feedback, they might just Bro, increase their yo. overall effort. Effort that... Real quick, let me see. So we got 44K, huh? 44K. 200, 600. This is three videos. I, listen, I understand you got some videos over here. This is three videos. He, he got next, man. I ain't gonna lie. Yo, Michael McKelvey... He got next, bro. This is May crazy shine work. through on the defensive end. So again, this paper shouldn't be taken as gospel. It's not as straightforward. Remember his name, Chad. There's this rubber band effect that we see across many different sports, across virtually every NBA season. He, yeah, he's looking like rookie of the year. Comebacks. Uh, the difference here being the rubber band effect is looking at outcomes. This paper was trying to use outcomes to determine causation, a far more challenging feat. We might not ever I said have dying a method. full I said dying understanding method. as to what the causation is. Jimmy Highroller with a face cam is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Is here, and that's okay. Contrary to most media outlets, we're not looking for a single narrative, a single reason as to why something is occurring. We understand that we're performing a multivariate analysis here. And there's complexity. That does not mean that understanding the outcome in this case, that this rubber band effect exists, is unvaluable. Very clearly there are coaches, analysts, players that misunderstand this concept of risk. Something that has always fascinated me. One cannot avoid risk because not taking risk is a form of risk. There's a risk to paralysis. Yo, that's a bar. Chad, that's a bar, bro. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let me run that back. Did y'all hear what he said? Did y'all hear what he said? Listen, 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 listen. 
Let me turn it up a little bit too. Not taking risk is a form of risk. There's mm. a risk to paralysis. Oftentimes, oh, no. this is the greatest risk. You can't eliminate it. All you can hope to do is measure it. Because if you can measure it, then you can try to manage it. Even at the highest level, risk averse is an oxymoron. And this misunderstanding parlays into much of life. Coming out of college, many of my friends chose safe careers, safe jobs, often citing the low risk nature of said path. But from another perspective, their path was at high risk of not doing something fulfilling with their life. Measuring and managing risk will always be a constant battle, but it's an example of why we shouldn't just trust our gut alone because intuition is going to feel just as good when it's right as it does when it's wrong. That's really the purpose, I think, of analytics or statistics is to help with that. Clearly, we have to trust our gut the vast majority of the day. I mean, you wouldn't want to be driving and doing the trigonometry of changing lanes while you're changing lanes. It might lead to more accidents. Uh, very similarly, a coach wouldn't want to be no, yeah. telling a player to think about the calculus of their shot <laughs> while they're shooting. It might lead to more missed shots. It might be counterproductive. There's always going to be that balance between thinking and doing. Hope you enjoyed Jesus Christ, man. This is, this is like thinking basketball with and i don't even know if thinking basketball play, play pro he might have this is thinking basketball if he played pro with nba storyteller type editing like th this, this 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 guy is the victor romanyama of this nba shit bro like this is this is actually crazy this is actually crazy that was a fantastic video by the way um in regards to the topic of the video i mean i ain't gonna lie he dove into it way more than i did i can't really disagree with what he's saying there are a lot of variables to account for when it comes to this whole conversation. And he did, you know, he tried to account for it. He tried to account for everything. Um, I liked how everything that he talked about wasn't just backed up with statistics. Like he 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 got into the psyche of a basketball player, what that's like, why like the different motivations as to why people act the way that they do. And it, it makes perfect sense. It makes it makes perfect sense to me. Um, the underdog the underdog mentality is it's real. It's real. And I'm, you know, essentially showing that, yeah, the numbers back it up. The numbers definitely back it up that when you are down, pressure builds diamonds. Pressure, pressure builds diamonds, you know? Sometimes it fails and you can't all the way get to that diamond. But it has the potential to make diamonds, and it points you to the right direction. You know what I'm saying? Lo losing, losing, um, you know, there's more to gain from losing than there is from not playing the game. You see what I'm saying? 